Um, everyone, my name is Matt Yar. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, we're going to talk about advanced heart failure. Uh, to get there, I like to kind of hit up on heart failure management and then shock. I have my email included. I have my name there. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or need anything. Um, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. I have no conflicts of interest. Um, the overview, we're going to go talk a little bit about epidemiology, heart failure definitions, etiology, management, shock, and advanced heart failure. So if I can't emphasize on heart failure being an important thing for you guys as internists or even future specialists, these are some of the values to talk about. I'll tell you what's board important as well. So heart failure affects 6.5 million adults in the United States. It's projected to affect greater than um, 8 million people with the age of 18 and over. At 40 years of age, a lifetime risk of developing heart failure in both men and women is one out of five. That's a board-related question or a buzz question that I've seen a couple of times in some couple of question banks. Um, Greater than 650,000 new cases annually, greater than 1 million admissions annually. One in nine deaths has a heart failure mentioned within the certificate. Five-year mortality remains around 50%. That's another board important question. 30-day readmission rates are 24% and five-year survival rates as mentioned is 50. 90-day uh, post-discharge mortality after an acute decompensation is 14%. And I think a lot of times we don't realize you know, when somebody says somebody has metastatic cancer, I think you all realize what the implications are. Everyone understand what that means. But a lot of times when somebody says, oh, this patient has heart failure, we don't have the same red flags and the same alarms in our head. It's like, oh, he has heart failure. We'll manage the fluids. We'll put him on medical therapy and we'll follow him outpatient. So I hope if you can learn one thing from my lecture, is how important understanding the prognosis in heart failure is and how important it is to correctly optimize and aggressively optimize these patients. Um, I hope this is all a review, but to talk about heart failure, there was a recent article, uh, basically universal definition classification that was published. And finally, we had ESC, AHA, ACC, all these big uh, groups come together. Um, and uh, put basically a collaborative statement of what the definitions are. So what's the definition? Heart failure is a clinical syndrome. Okay, I wanna underline that. With current or prior symptoms or signs or causes of structural or functional cardiac abnormality, and which is collaborated by one of the following, either an elevated anti-proBNP or BNP, or an objective evidence of previous things that relate to congestion, low flow, or other things. So it could be an echo, right heart cath, cardiac MRI, but some kind of a defined method with heart failure symptomatology, which usually are because of congestion, but at times could be because of low flow as well. In addition, they're, they've went ahead further and classified or subclassified these um, patients with terms that we can all now agree on. So it's now heart failure with reduced in patients with ejection fraction less than 40%. And I'll tell you, EF is not a best way in any shape or form to identify or subgroup these patients. However, it's the best horrible way to do it. And the fact that we don't have really better ways of defining some of these patients. So you know, I'm sure you've seen a patient with an EF of 30% that was doing okay, quote unquote. And then you had a patient that had an e same EF that was doing horrific. So moving on from heart failure with reduced EF, you have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is of those with an EF greater than 50. Um, mid-range, as the name suggests, is within the mid-range. And improved is that it was a reduced EF, it has improved to now greater than 40% or greater than 10% from what it was previous. What I'll tell you is, while we do not have great therapies for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we had a um, emperor preserved 
curve that just came out and we are all from a heart failure standpoint super excited because we finally have a medication that definitely has symptomatology effect and might have some effect in cardiac morbidity as well but we don't have really good medications but we do have some studies that point that people that have heart failure with reduced and while it improves, you should continue the medical therapies and those patients do better with continued therapies. So those are the definite, the classifications that exist. Further on, I assume you all know these classifications, but forgive me, I'll still go through them. NYJ classification, one through four, one, practically no symptomatology um, with even uh, severe activities and four, basically symptomatic at rest. The way I look at a CCH okay, classification is the thing that you move forward on. What, is, what do I mean? You can have stage A, which I think all Americans are practically in stage A category because it's at high risk of developing heart failure. And as we age and with our eating habits and with our comorbidities, we all have a risk of heart failure. Stage B is people that have structural disease that are seen, but no symptomatology. And once you go from a to B, you stay in B, and once you go from B to C, you stay in C, and C to D, you stay in D, relevant of why what your NYHA classification is. So C is someone that has had symptom at some point, um, and D is people that are kind of on the decline uh, with their pump failure. Why is it important to understand all these things? If you catch people earlier on in the disease process and optimize medical therapy, you have a chance of prevent adverse remodeling and as such prevent progression or decrease the speed in the progression of their disease. You can make a genuine difference in these patients' lives by appropriately finding, diagnosing, and treating these patients. I'm sure you all know this, and I guess if there's one thing we can connect to the previous lectures you had today, uh, there are many different etiologies for heart failure, one of such things being HIV. Uh, but the most common reason is ischemic heart disease, which makes up about 70% of uh, your heart failure patients. Um, hypertension plays a factor as well, making up about 7%. Um, and then you have some of the other um, reasons from valvulopathy, myocarditis, chemo-related or um, onc related basically, uh, cardiomyopathies and um, alcohol. I hope by now you all have seen this beautiful chart. ESC does a really good job of also bringing all these. So if you wanna look at guidelines <laughs> while we are in America, I would recommend you look at our European counterparts because on one side you can see an easy way to how to manage these patients, but also they usually have better charts and better graphs. Um, but the way I assess patients with heart failure is using that chart. Are they warm or are they cold? Are they dry or are they wet? You all have dealt with warm and dry patients. These are patients you see in clinic doing well, you're optimizing their medical treatment. They're mostly doing really well. Warm and wet. They could be in the emergency room, they could be admitted to medicine services, you're trying to fluid optimize and then medically optimize them. When you hit the cold, you need to think about hypoperfusion, you need to think about getting further workup and considering getting that patient as soon as possible to at least CCU, especially if there's other reasons that show hypoperfusion from elevated lactate, worsening renal function, uh, congestive hepatopathy, all of those could be a factor which makes you realize this is a low perfusion state. The patient would benefit from some kind of an inotropic agent and further management. I'll tell you, the patients that worry me the most or scare me the most is the cold and dry patients because usually these patients are patients that will be inotropic dependent even on discharge and will need more aggressive workup and consideration for advanced therapies. This is from the European, uh, from the ESC kind of talking about management, which I think you all are aware of, but I'm going to kind of skim through this. And the reason being is I would recommend a different path than this. So the old thought process, ACE or ACE are beta blocker. If there's still symptomatology MRAs, um, if the EF is less than 35%, consider ARNI, um, which is being your interest though. If the heart rate after optimization of beta blockers 
is not less than 70 in a sinus rhythm, consider Ivabradine. And if your QRS with the left bundle is prolonged, you can consider CRT. So I believe you all are aware of this. And sorry if I'm kind of skimming through this, but it's because I want to get to the actual topic that I want to discuss. Um, this is a very prolonged way to look at it, which ACC gives out. What I want to talk about is this paper by McMurray. So this is more of a suggestion, and I think it's a great suggestion. So how should we sequence these patients? Should we start them on ACE and ARB and slowly titrate? What they talk about is how these patients that go through our conventional method of titration, it takes us six months to optimize these patients. And a lot of times they get missed in this process. Right, so let's optimize the ACE and ARB, let's op optimize the beta blocker, let's consider the MRA, let's consider switching to an RNE, let's consider adding an SGLT2 inhibitor. Their new proposed method, and if you listen to their talk actually about this, they talk about the order on how they do things is not important. So it's not really saying that we should consider beta blockers before RNEs or whatnot. The real important thing is consider placing patients on double therapy in the hospital, consider starting something at, on the discharge, and then having them follow up and getting optimized further outpatient. So whether that's Arnie and SGLT2, um, and then getting some low-dose beta blocker on discharge and having that op being optimized, but the goal is to get to our goal therapy much sooner and much more aggressively, to have a much better chance of at worst, preventing further progression of their heart failure and at best possibly allowing them genuine recovery or some element of recovery. <clears throat> this is where I'll seek you guys' guidance. I hope you all have gone through your MICU rotations and uh, our pulmonary and critical care colleagues are so good with managing shock. Um, let's talk about it. And we have the most important shock is uh, on top. I mean, I'm not biased at all, but can you guys help guide me about cardiac output SVR and wedge or LVDP pressures regarding cardiogenic shock? Can you guys tell me what you expect in these patients? Don't all speak at once. Beautiful. Well said. So, you know, these are the stereotypical pic pictures of patients you talk about. The cardiac output is decreased because you're having low flow states. The SVR is uh, increased because the body is trying to maintain a blood pressure. So you have catecholamine surge, you have a much clamped down body uh, or vasculature and as such an elevated SVR. And in addition to this, these patients are usually fluid overloaded, both in the setting of severely elevated SVR and in the setting of cardiorenal syndrome. How about obstructive, whether that's PE or tamponade? This is a harder question. Down, neutral, neutral. All right, let's see. All right, so it really depends on which modality we're looking at. And what I mean is, is this a PE related obstruction or tamponade related obstruction? In both, you usually do get a decreased cardiac output. And the reason being in PE, you have a poor LV preload, and as such, you can have uh, further effects or in tamponade, definitely directly, you can have decreased filling, just decreased stroke volume, and as such, a decreased cardiac output. Similarly, SVR can be elevated against because of you having a catecholamine surge and clamping down. And as such, with the wedge, it really depends on which reason. So if it's PE, it can actually be normal or decreased because you have a decreased preload, but you have an increase on the LV and an increased afterload. So I would say that's more of a question mark depending on what's exactly happening. Hypovolemia, that should be easy.
let's say hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, all those fun. Okay. Well said. So cardiac output is down. My question to you guys, though, I feel like this is sometimes, uh, especially I feel like with interns, they have a hard time conceptualizing why. Why is cardiac output down? SVR is easy, right? SVR is up because you're clamping down. Again, catecholamine surge. Your wedge is down because you have low volumes. Why is cardiac output decreased? Beautiful. Well said. Thank you. You guys are rocking it. Love it. So, <laughs> so cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Your heart rate is usually increasing in these patients. So a lot of times people are wondering, oh, why is the cardiac output down? But when you don't, when you don't have shock at the beginning, you might have a neutral or maybe even semi-elevated cardiac output. But when you get to the shock stage, your stroke volume is so decreased that you have a decreased cardiac output, as you guys aptly mentioned. Um, I'm going to kind of give the answer for the rest of them and kind of skip through the rest. What I'll tell you is interesting about a lot of the neurogenic uh, shock standpoint is that is one of the few shocks where you also get um, bradycardia a lot of times associated with it while you, so, you know, unlike a cardiogenic shock, for example, where you have, uh, you can have uh, tachyarrhythmia and a catecholamine surge and neurogenic, you have a decreased SVR, but also have bradycardia and you don't have the appropriate compensatory mechanism that you expect, which is an increased cardiac index. Um, I'll leave it as that, and I'll switch to my advanced heart failure talk. What is advanced heart failure? I think, I think we all know who these patients are, but we don't think about it as much. So these are the patients you keep seeing with severe symptomatology, signs sometimes at rest, recurrent hospitalization despite guideline determination medical therapy or patients you're weaning off of guideline medical therapy because you're having issues with their management now. They're now too hypotensive. Now they're developing lightheadedness. They're now having worsening renal function and you're weaning medical therapy. Requiring advanced therapy such as consideration of transplant mechanical circuitry support or palliation. This is another way to look at it. It mentions some like specific points, whether that's a serum sodium that's down, rise of beer and cranin, uh, blood pressure systolics of less than 90 um, or what. I mentioned a couple of studies, why? So <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of this. When we discharge patients on inotropes, they have overall worse outcome. There is, no real good studies. The studies we have are superbly old, but the reason we look at these studies is patients with advanced heart failure don't do well, and their six months mortality is around 50%, okay? And the study I mentioned here, uh, so one of the studies is effects of oral murinone on mortality and severe chronic heart failure patients. What's interesting to me is look at patients both on murinone or placebo at six months out, and look at their overall survival probability. And you're sitting somewhere around 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Irrelevant if they got melanone or not, they don't really have a great survival. Sorry. Moving on from that, another study, which basically is uh, they were using swans and they were trying to titrate um, with inotropes and vasodilators in patients in cardiogenic shock. And similarly, look at, at 180 days, and I'm not trying to even talk about the trial itself, rather showing you in advanced heart failure patients at six months, irrelevant of therapy, their six months mortality was pretty great. As you can see here, they were around 50% mortality or even uh, worse than that. So this is all to make a point that in stage D heart failure, these patients don't do well. And we need to have a consideration of advanced therapies sooner than this stage. Let's talk about a little bit of palliation and what the overall trajectory is. Our goals as physicians, we always try to think about what to do to help our patients. Sometimes that 
response is also palliative therapy. We need to start earlier with patients we know are not doing well with their heart failure before they reach that stage D. And having this discussion of what are our goals? What is the trajectory of this disease? Have you been optimized enough? And where are we going? Um, I think a well state, set statement is difficult discussions now will simplify difficult decisions in the future. Um, a lot of factors go into patient decision from cost, survival, quality of life, and each patient is different. I think this is a really good representation of how our patients do. You have the, the onset heart failure. We go optimize medical therapy. We go aggressively within medical therapy. The patients might have a sudden death from VT. That's why we always have them get ICT or ICD or CRT, depending on whether they have um, an EF of less than 35% with left bundle or without left bundle and a wide MQRS. Um, and then as time progresses, we have multiple decompensations. And I like to hope that by the time you get here in this range, they've seen a cardiologist. And I hope by this range, they've seen an advanced heart failure specialist. Um, and so we can prevent this further aggressive decline. But as you can see here, we have a pump failure as a reason for demise in these patients that don't have sun death. And uh, you know that's when we go either to palliation or consideration of transplant. But a lot of times when we reach these stages, it's we have worse outcome. So there was a 2017 ACC expert consensus on optimization of heart failure. They mentioned a paper, and as somebody mentioned, Dr. Yancey, who is amazing and on practically everything, um, was on this. And it, you know they pointed out a paper, which I love, the I Need Help paper by Dr. Baumwall. And let's discuss this. I want in the back of your head to think about this when you see a heart failure patients. Is the patient requiring inotrope? So is there been previous or ongoing requirements of dobutamine, myrnone? Is the patient persistently in NYJ class three or teeter-tottering into the class four and persistently high BNPs and anti-pro BNPs? Is there or end organ dysfunction? worsening renal or liver dysfunction setting of heart failure. Is the ejection fraction below 20%? How many patients you guys have seen with the EF less than 20% where they haven't seen an advanced therapist? So advanced heart failure specialist to be specific. Defibrillator shock, so recurrent appropriate shocks. How about hospitalization more than one in the past 12 months with heart failure? Edema or escalating diuretics, so they have persistent fluid overload state, and you keep increasing it to very high levels of uh, diuretics. Low blood pressure, um, or you either cannot enable, or you're unable to put them on guideline determined medical therapy, or you're weaning or decreasing doses of guideline determined medical therapy. So remember this, I need help. Remember that acronym. And if you get any of those things that are positive, please try to get these patients to see an advanced heart failure specialist. And, you know, they might be able to follow up with their primary care, they might be able to follow up with their cardiologist, but they should at least be assessed and, you know, some statement should be made or consideration be made in these patients' cares. Late referral leads to poor outcomes. A lot of times we get patients too late because these patients have sat through optimization and re-optimization and re-optimization. By the time they come to us, they're at extremis. They have congestive hepatopathy, they have cardiorenal, they're, you know, some element of CKD, maybe with AKI. And these patients with multi-organ failure do worse, irrelevant of what therapy we pick. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with Intermax. This might be a new term for some. So you guys all should know NYCHA. You guys all should know ACC classification. Intermax is the next classification I would like to discuss with you. It talks about, it's basically was a based on the VAD or MCS registry on how classifying patients that are sick. Because you've seen that NYCHA class for patient, and there's a wide variety of them. 
Some of them are just coming in, you're optimizing, maybe needing an inotrope temporarily, but you know they're gonna go home without it and that's it. Some of them, they're requiring inotropes and even then you have to optitrate their inotropes and they're having multi-organ failure. Those, both of those patients are stage D NYJ class four, but I'll tell you they're not the same patient and their mortality isn't the same. So stage seven is these class three patients with uh, no current or recurrent uh, unstable fluid status. So your NYJ3 kind of class patients. Um, Intermax six is minor limitations, physical activity, absence of congestion while at rest, easily fatigued. So the, they're progressing to the realm of requiring us. Four and five patients are patients that have more serious symptomatology. So they might need some levels of support there and they're doing poorly with activity. So complete cessation of physical activity, stable at rest, but frequent moderate fluid retention at some level of renal dysfunction. With stage four, you have temporary cessation of iotropic treatment is possible, but patient presents with frequent symptom recurrences. And definitely at stage four, we are making our decisions on that transplant and optimization. The, during these four and five, we're going as aggressive as we can to give medical therapy a chance. And then as you start falling, where you're requiring inotropes, so dependence for stability, sliding on inotropes and crash and burn patient is where we are, we are definitely at that point getting the rest of our uh, tools in our box to kind of uh, get things moving. <laughs> this is a very friendly, easy to look at, you know, classification of patients. <laughs> um, and it shows you their status for transplant listing. I don't need you to go through it. Let's, let's look at a slightly simpler view of that. But basically your status one are those crashing patients. Status two are the patients that have some level of requirement and there's something going on, whether they're having VTVF, their device is not dischargeable because something is going on with them, so they're not doing that well. Even status three, a lot of times, need to be hospitalized. They're slightly more stable, but not stable enough to go home. Four is the status where there's something going on. They definitely need a transplant consideration, but at this point, they can be home on inotropes or some other reasoning. Um, and then, as you can see, five and six that are below it. What do the guidelines say? And I repeat guidelines because I think for you guys' the standpoint, the only reason for my lecture is to overemphasize on one side, when should you make sure that your patient have seen us? Because I think that's going to have a genuine effect on your patient's well-being. But on the other side, board-related questions that you might get out of this. So bridge to transplant or MCS in stage D re refractory to guideline determined medical therapy is 2A. Uh, for inotropic support and cardiogenic shock pending a, a definitive therapy or resolution is class one. And class three is routine IV inotropic use um, is a class three or short-term use without evidence of shock or threat and organ dysfunction. Because we know inotropes are, don't help people in an immediate setting and can have, these patients can have worse outcomes with the two very old trials that I mentioned. So heart transplant algorithm, when do you list? You look at the Intermax score, you see where they're falling at. Uh, four to seven, you're going, you're having the active discussion about transplant, having an active discussion about LVAT, you're optimizing their guideline medical therapy. And once they pass that stage four, you've already had all the work up, everything you need. But when they pass that stage, you're working on MCS, VANS, um, transplant, all of those things. And the, the, you're putting the you know, train in motion to get the patient taken care of. What's the great data? What's the good data? As we progress through time, we are having much better outcomes with our transplant patients. Our transplant patients, our median survival is 12.4. I will tell you at our institution, they do much better than that. 
So we have really good data of how long these patients are surviving and how well, well they're doing. Uh, we have definitely patients within 20 years out, 25 years out that are still doing very well. And, you know, so if you get these patients that are sick out and get them appropriate therapy, they can have great outcomes. How about this? And sorry, this might be a little bit confusing, but I will ask you kindly to look on the right hand side, right upper. So we talk about VADs. These are patients, again, realize these are NYJ class four ACC stage D patients that had a five year, uh, I mean, sorry, five, a six months mortality of 50% or less, right? So these are the sickest of the sick. And with VAD, if you look down here for uh, 60 months, they have about 50% survival. That's not a small number. Again, if I, if I told you, let's say you're in the same situation and you have a six months survival of 50% versus five years survival of 50% and meaningful because a lot of these studies, and I'm not gonna go through them, uh, but I, there's plenty of studies that have been done from the HeartMate 3, uh, HVAD, uh, HeartMate 2 before it, Jarvik, uh, multitudes of VAD studies that have come before it and started all with Heart, uh, HeartMate kind of XVE. All of these have shown these patients overall feel better, are more active, doing more things. But, you know, having a five-year, <clears throat> even in the destination therapy group, a five-year uh, mortality at 43% is a long way we've come in the past 20 years, where their mortality at six months was 50%. Or with HeartMate XVE, where their two-year mortality was 50%. So, you know, these are meaningful things you can do for your patients. All right, now let's talk about the heart. I want to ask you guys to think differently about the heart than what we, you might be used to. A lot of times when we talk about the heart as preload and afterload. And most people think of preload as what the RV sees and afterload as what the LV sees. The heart is not like that. The heart is in series. It's two different pumps that are connected in series that function together, that have their own preload, have their own afterload. And each site that's lacking can cause their own issues. So this is how I think of a heart. You have two pumps, like mentioned, they both have the same things. So you have your preload that goes on the RV um, with the afterload, which is seen in the resistance in the pulmonary vasculature. And there are methods to bring down that, bring down that uh, resistance, depending on why the resistance is there, whether it's, you know, from primary who class one pulmonary hypertension versus who class two versus the rest of the who classifications, but there's different methods of dealing with this. And there are medications that we can use in this process to deal with it. Similarly, you can have low preload in the left side from one reason or another, PE, like we were talking about obstructive. Um, and then uh, similarly, a high afterload on the left heart. And all of these can affect your overall shock state. It can affect your overall um, how your heart is doing as well. And the reason I bring this up is when you talk about at least either temporary MCS or mechanical circuitry support devices or durable MCS devices, if you don't understand what's happening to both pumps, you do not fully understand what's going on. So let me ask you this. One of my, when I was a first year cardiology fellow, one of my attendings asked us this, and I think it was a very good question, a tricky question, but let me do this to a horrible question. So if you have RV failure and you put an LVAD in, so left ventricular assist device, what's gonna to happen to the RV? Is it gonna get better or is it gonna get worse? Better question mark. 
Ooh. Okay. One person said better without the question mark. Everyone has a question mark with the better. Okay. Why do you guys think it's going to get better? Can you explain that to me? Beautiful. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. If you had massive inferior posterior kind of infarction where the RV has gone through a lot, what happens if you put an L at it? Do you guys understand my question? So think of, so some of you are saying better and I don't disagree with that, um, but if you have had an RV that's fully infarcted or has very poor function, secondary to chronic lung disease and pulmonary hypertension, secondary to lung disease and where it's the RV has been destroyed or secondary to an infarction, what happens if you put an LVAD? Beautiful. Well said. So it will be worse. So both answers are correct. It really depends on the etiology. Then that's hence why I said trick question. It depends on the etiology. So if you tell me this is a patient with LV failure who has developed RV failure secondary to fluid overload state, you putting an LVAT fixes that issue. So even if you have some element of pulmonary hypertension in a WHO class two fashion, there's a, there's a good chance that's going to resolve and recover, and that RV is going to do better. Even if there is a semi-fixed pulmonary hypertension, I don't know if you guys understand what I'm saying, so let me explain. Pulmonary hypertension. You have um, SWAN numbers, which I'm not sure how often you guys deal with them, but let's say someone has an elevated wedge of 20 and they have a mean pulmonary pressure of 35, that means their transpulmonary gradient is 15. So 35 minus 20, 15, which means they, they have both, some of that uh, pulmonary hypertension is because of the elevated fluid status on the left, but also there's some intrinsic reasons. And that can happen from chronic heart failure. Um, even in those patients that have not had that chronic heart failure, if you put an LVAD in, fix the LV issue, decrease the afterload on the RV, the RV can recover. In a primary infarcted or chronic fixed pulmonary hypertension, that RV will get worse because you now have much higher preload. Does that make sense? I would say yes. If the if the scar and ischemia has been, if there's a genuine scar in the RV, the answer is yes. If there is ischemic that you've helped resolve with a stent, um, then then it can. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> so then, if there is a ischemia where you've helped resolve, let's say by putting a stent in. RV can be resilient and it can recover in the long term. So it, yes, it depends on what the reasoning is and that can play a factor. So let's go further. Do you guys know what a balloon pump is? So we're gonna talk about our temporary MCS devices. What's a balloon pump? And where does it sit? It sits in the aorta, kind of affects pumping blood. Um, beautiful. I see a possible future cardiologist amongst these text groups. Uh, so yes, well said. So the balloon pump sits after the, um, so after the three great vessels and before your renal artery. 
it inflates during a diastole or like at the tail end of realistically systole and deflates in beginning of systole. The reason it works um, is because of the fact that it, you know, while it deflates, we think there's some suction effect, some decrease afterload, some movement of the blood forward about 0.5 liters per minute, kind of like a cardiac index. So not much of a real pump effect. We also think it helps perfuse the coronary as well because it helps, it inflates at the tail end of systole and helps with the blood going back into your coronary cusps and filling um, your coronaries. So we use it a lot of time in ischemic disease patients um, who either not intervened upon or have mild elements of shock or are pending cabbage uh, when they come in with NSTEMI. And sometimes even our, our coronary, you know, our uh, um, cardiogenic shock uh, patients when they don't need much support. I think you guys all answered this, but, you know, it has minimal effects on cardiac index. It decreases the afterload because of this uh, suction event, because of the fact that it deflates in uh, systole. Um, and not much directly into the preload effect, but because it's pumping blood forward can increase some element of preload. What's an impella? And by the way, you're correct. There's multiple modes, one to one, one to two, one to three. And that all of what that means is with how many EQRSs are you supporting the heart? One to one meaning with every attempt you're supporting it, one to three meaning every third attempt uh, you're supporting it. And as you get less supportive, there's going to be a higher chance of coagulation because you have a foreign object in the vasculature, and there's going to be a more of a reason for anticoagulation. What's an impella? It's a forward flow pump that sits, that's basically they go in from usually femoral artery, can go uh, from the arm as well. So uh, is placed in the LV, it directly, it has an impeller. It sucks blood out of your LV and pumps it into the, to the aorta directly. So um, what can you think of about afterload? What does it do to afterload? What does it do to preload? What does it do to cardiac index? Fun cause of hemolysis, not if it's correctly placed um, and not if you're appropriately anticoagulating it. So I've rarely seen hemolysis with these devices. The times I see hemolysis is when they're close to the valvular apparatus and as such shearing or, or the device is in such high settings and you're having RV failure and the, you have almost no preload on the LV, and as such, you don't have adequate uh, volume status, and so the device keeps suctioning. If you're suctioning, you're going to um, cause a lot of hemolysis and the fun things that come after that. So you can have, you can adequately increase your cardiac index depending on the device specifically used. You can, uh, uh, you know, almost do a durable VAT level uh, improvement. So within three to four improvement within cardiac index to the preload into your LV, uh, it can increase your preload because now you're pumping blood forward um, and it decreases your afterload because you're directly sucking out of your LV and as such pumping blood forward. So what the LV sees is that decrease overall pressure because something else is directly helping it. And that's what it looks like, by the way. So the five, uh, that's what the five or any of the rest looks like. The five, five looks a little bit differently, but basically there's an inlet, there's an outlet, the pump will suck the blood out and pump forward. And as you can imagine, by the way, things that can go wrong, if the device is too far in, it's going to suck into the, from the LV and pump into the LV. And if it's too far out, it if you're already crossed out of the aortic valve, you're gonna suck from the aorta and pump into the aorta and the device will alarm like crazy, but you're not really doing any help. ECMO, what's ECMO? And I'm not talking about VV ECMO, I'm not a pulmonologist. Uh, 
you know, uh, let's talk about fun things. So what's a VA ECMO? And that's not Veterans Affair. So um, venous arterial ECMO. What does it do for all of this? So by the way, for those of you that don't know VA ECMO, you put a big, large cannula in the venous system. You put a large cannula in the arterial system. It sucks. Usually imagine femoral and femoral. You suck blood out of the femoral vein. You push it back into the femoral artery. And as such as you can imagine, first off, the blood is going the wrong direction in your femoral artery. It's going towards the body, not away from, you know, it's not going from the heart towards your lower extremity. It's going from the, uh, your leg all the way towards the heart. So you have five liters or more that's coming towards the heart. Um, and as you can imagine, if we have changed the flow of blood in the femoral artery, you might have to have this distal perfusion cannulas to feed the rest of the leg, or you can get necrosis and other issues because of this. It can oxygenate and take over the overall heart function. But what can you imagine is a problem with this device? Afterload, why? What happens if I sh could shove five liters of blood per minute towards the left heart? What's your afterload doing? It's going through the roof because you're, you're having a full, like another heart pumping all the way against your actual heart. And your heart now has to overcome the pressures that are sitting in the aorta, which are higher than what it's been, and pump against that to be able to pump blood forward. And as such, you have severely ele elevated afterload. Um, and that, by the way, can lead to issues because it, that's why a lot of times we vent the LV, meaning we put an impella or other devices to empty out the left ventricle or put in a tandem heart to uh, empty out the uh, left atrium and as such vent the LV because the pressures that your heart has to overcome will stress out the heart. And as such, if you have ischemic disease, it's gonna worsen your overall cardiomyopathy. If this is a temporary measure, it's a great way to support the body and support oxygenation um, in the temporary time. But otherwise there is problems with this. Preload, it will decrease preload. That should make sense because you're sucking blood out of femoral vein or wherever the cannula is. And as such, you're decreasing preload, increasing afterload, and you can pump the full level cardiac index. What's North-South syndrome? There's a lot of names for it. Have you guys heard of that? Why is it that in VA ECMO patients, we put an arterial right, line on the right in the right um, radial artery, not the left? Any takers? This is hard level question. So anyone wants to answer this? So basically, if you can imagine, you have two pumps working against each other. You have the pump from your ECMO device pumping blood towards the heart, but then you have the heart itself that's gonna pump blood forward. And if you have lung issues or ECMO lung or anything else, you're gonna have decreased oxygenation within the blood that's coming from the heart. So let's say the patient has COVID and has poor oxygenation standpoint at this point. You're gonna have deoxygenated blood that's gonna be pumped from your LV into the aorta. So what's gonna happen is sometimes your right subclavian will take, get the most majority of its blood from the heart. So you might have the right side of the heart that's getting superbly lower oxygenated blood as opposed to the left parts because a lot of those might be more from the ECMO itself. And as such, you will have differences in your oxygenation within the upper extremities. And that's why we always put it on the right side because it's the first branch coming off from the heart. And if the oxygenation levels are good at that standpoint, great. Otherwise, we need to consider further cannulas or further methods of oxygenating the right, you know, upper sides of the body. This is kind of a quick look. Uh, tandem, I kind of skipped, but uh, Tandem has a cannula that sits in the LA and then it sucks from there and then also shoves it into the femoral artery. 
Big problem with it, it's a great device, but big problem with it, the patient cannot be mobile. And uh, if the patient moves or moves their leg, that uh, cannula in the LA can get dislodged and come to the RA and you might get deoxygenated blood that's flowing. And as such, you're gonna have problems. And I've seen that only once and it's a frightening uh, event. Um, and I think that's, and this is a VAD, and this is what a VAD looks like. Do you guys have any questions? So this is a durable VAD or a VAD that stays within the heart and the patients get discharged with them. This is a HeartMate 3. It's a centrifugal pump. There, uh, it's an impeller, not a propeller. And the motor is levitated. So it's like a submarine. Superbly interesting, at least to me. <laughs> so any questions, guys? Well, thanks so much, Mahir. We have your email address. This was a great presentation. Thanks for making it so interactive for us too. Um, and feel free to send uh, Mahir any questions that you have over email. I wanna be respectful of all of your time. So we will go ahead and, and um, start shutting down the Zoom, but please let us know if you have any questions and we'll see you guys soon. Please fill out your evaluations as well.